Thank you very much for joining us. My name is um, Yvonne Lobos. I am from the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Germany, and I have the pleasure to welcome you to this session where we'll try to answer one of those very easy questions that we like to set for ourselves. And today we're going to try to figure out what are the conditions for success for large-scale um, land restoration. And uh, creating these conditions for success is going to be one of the main questions that we'll answer today. And I wanted to start with uh, saying two words about how exciting it is to discuss this very topic in this session today, because we have been seeing a lot of momentum created for these type of initiatives. Just today we witnessed the official launch of the 20 by 20 initiative where many Latin American countries have pledged to restore 20 million hectares by 2020. And like this, there have been many other initiatives that have been successful in many ways, have faced challenges in other ways. So the main question that I wanted to start with was if we're going to be talking today about how to create these conditions for success, what is, the, what is really a successful land restoration project and initiative? So as we have seen from many experiences, most of the most successful restoration initiatives have been a combination of very highly uh, advanced technical expertise uh, combined with collaboration with multiple stakeholders, private, public, civil society. They have also very much involved new forms of inclusive governance and diversified sources of funds and resources. And we have many examples. We saw yesterday the example of um, Tigray in Ethiopia. We have seen many other examples of large-scale soil decontamination initiatives. Um, there's a lot of successful examples of restoration. So it seems that we know from a technical perspective and from an implementation perspective how to do land restoration. So if we know this, then I would like to pose questions here and to get us thinking about why most of these projects usually never fail, but also never manage to scale up. We also keep on facing challenges for the successful implementation of landscape approaches in, within existing governance systems at the national level. And we also see a lot of projects that are most times, or a lot of the times, unsuccessfully attempting to make the business case for pro-poor land restoration. So I wanted to be a bit provocative and set the stage with these questions because I want us to um, think today of not only ways of how to create the perfect world or the perfect uh, wish list of what would be successful in terms of these initiatives, but I want us to focus on the how. Exactly how and how can we feasibly create strategies for these land restoration projects to work on the field. So in the time that we have today, we're going to have um, a presentation at the beginning to introduce some of the topics that we'll be discussing that are based on the brief that you have um, found on your chairs. And then we're going to have a discussion with our panelists and interaction also with you to try to answer this very difficult question that we have set out for ourselves. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Deborah Bosio, the Director of Soil Research for the International Center of Tropical Agriculture. Please, Debbie, come here and give us an introduction. Great, thank, thank you, Yvonne, and welcome everyone to, to this afternoon session right after lunch. I'm really pleased to see everyone drag themselves away from the the coffee, the coffee tables to, to come and be with us this afternoon. What we're really trying to do is delve deeper into some of the concepts and, and uh, things that were addressed this morning through this very inspiring launch of the 20 by 20. Uh, as you know, land degradation is not a new issue. And um, it's actually um, uh, really exciting that it's one sort of renewed attention now in recent years after more than de several decades, I would say, of neglect and, in fact, pessimism. Most of the, most of the rhetoric we've been hearing in the recent past is very, is very pessimistic, it's very nihilistic, there's not really much we can do. But, but uh, this launch this morning was one example of a much more optimistic view about really being able to tackle these issues of land degradation. I think that part of this um, momentum started with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, sort of a beginning of a turnaround in thinking about land degradation and the ecosystem services that we require from our land kind of broadened the debate about what we're talking about. Later came this bond challenge, um, which set the pattern for defining specific targets for land restoration, especially in forested landscapes. 
More recently, the Rio Plus 20 drew attention to this idea of a land degradation neutral world, which has now actually found its way into the, the draft of the post-2015 uh, sustainable development goals. And now the New York, most recently, the New York Declaration on Forests is, is uh, continuing that trend. So everyone in this room is pretty much familiar with the reasons for heightened concern. Increasing land scarcity, increasing foreign direct, direct investment in land because of that scarcity, rising demand for food, population pressure on marginal lands, deteriorating ecosystem services, and so forth. We've heard alarming numbers. A quarter of the world's surface already degraded, 24 billion tons of soil lost to erosion every year. The cost of global land degradation reaching $490 billion per year. While we're here at the COP20 to really focus on climate change, climate change adaptation and mitigation, we believe the greater short-term risks and threats to all of us are these big land use changes, land degradation associated with them, and uh, you know, re related to the scope of agriculture, increasing urbanization, et cetera. The good news is that, as we saw this morning, this growing concern is really starting to translate into stronger global commitment to tackle this problem. And this, in turn, is giving rise to action. Uh, we saw uh, in, one, in one assessment that in 2013, $6 billion in programs designed to help 7 million rural households to manage land sustainably was invested. We've heard many examples in the different plenaries and sessions also of the Global Landscape Forum. And then we also heard this morning that there's $320 million aligned behind the 20 by 20. Very optimistic numbers. One thing that's very important about the 20 by 20, the 20 million hectares by, by the year 2020, is that it sets quantitative targets by country along the lines of the bond challenge. It also features explicit political and financial commitments which are essential for reaching the country targets. So clearly there's a lot of momentum building in support of this type of initiative. And in response to this, the Water, Land and Ecosystem Program of the CGIR, uh, along with the International Center for Tropical Agriculture and many of our partners, have embarked jointly with uh, many to search for ways to ensure that these efforts deliver results that actually meet the expectations of committed governments and financial investors. The landscapes we focus on are diverse, encompassing croplands and pastures, as well as forests under varying degrees of pressure. We're looking not just at the productive capacity of these landscapes or their forest cover, but also their other uses, whether for urban water supplies, uh, natural resources extraction, or cultural purposes. And not only do landscapes vary, but so do land restoration efforts. There really are no one-size-fits-all solutions, but on the contrary, each initiative requires a unique combination of policy, financial, and science components to assure success. And when I say success, I mean success in terms of restoring ecosystem services, more sustainable crop production, and tangible benefits for marginalized groups and women. To help get this combination right, in any particular case, we pose four, quick, four key questions in our work. And then we use the latest science-based tools uh, and approaches to find the answers. First, how can we maximize returns on investment? And when I say investment, I mean investment of public monies, but also increasingly of private monies. Any investment involves uncertainty, quite a lot of uncertainty. But science does have ways of reducing uncertainty, the odds that the investments will meet their objectives, increasing the odds. New modeling tools and participatory approaches allow us to evaluate investment options and determine which are most likely to boost agricultural productivity, enhance livelihoods, and restore ecosystem services. These tools include, for example, digital soil mapping, which now can bring big data into the hands of these smallholder farmers. Second, what are the best practices? You know, whether investments pay off depends on the land use, practices that rural people actually adopt. What can they adopt? What is the most feasible for them? CGIR centers, national research organizations, and many others have developed a wide range of sustainable solutions through decades of research on crops, soil, land, and water, and in every region of the developing world. This knowledge is an enormously valuable resource uh, for helping choose the best practices at a regional level and in, in a particular site or landscape. Third point, whose livelihoods are at stake? 
each and every hectare of land that were just promised uh, this morning in the 20 by 20 of the 20 million hectares of land, each hectare of land we're talking about is occupied or used by someone or some entity. Each has a stake in land restoration and must therefore be represented in key decisions. This is essential for achieving uh, the more equitable sharing of both the benefits and the responsibilities involved in land restoration. This in turn requires that we discover who land users are and what resources they have. To make information useful for planning, we literally need to put the people and their resources on the map. Fourth, who decides and how do we ensure accountability? As governments and investors provide more and more support for large-scale land restoration, they need strong assurance that their commitments are achieving the desired results. What degree of restoration was achieved? How large are the resulting benefits? Who captured these benefits? Where are the needs of women and marginalized people taken into account? In order to answer these questions, large-scale land-based restoration initiatives need to draw on science-based evidence for decision-making and for building accountability mechanisms. These mechanisms can take many different forms, but they should all ensure transparency, making it clear how the effectiveness of the specific investments were, was judged and by whom. Accountability and transparency are essential for building confidence, and confidence is the key for maintaining the commitment of governments, investors, development agencies, and the rural families whose livelihoods are really at stake. And I think the confidence, uh, are, and also to maintain the optimism that we're all feeling today after, after the recent launch, we, we need to maintain that optimism and move it forward at greater and greater momentum. With this as background, I'll turn the discussion back over to Yvonne, who will present our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah, for setting the discussions that we're going to have in a second. And for that, I would like to invite our panelists to join me here on the chairs on the stage. And I would like to start by introducing Walter Vergara, who is the senior fellow of the World Resources Institute. Please join me up here. Um, at the same time, I want to introduce Tefera Mengnistu, the advisor for the State Minister of Forest from the Ethiopian Ministry of Environment and Forest. Um, next, I would like to introduce Aloysius Campevuera, the director of the Department of Environmental Affairs of Malawi's Ministry of Natural Resources, Energy, and Environment. I also have the pleasure of inviting to the panel um, Leslie Dershinger, who is the founder and managing director of Terra Global Capital. And the pleasure is also um, mine of introducing um, Alexander Muller, um, a colleague of ours from uh, in Secretary General and the interim of the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies, ISS, in Germany. You switch to this microphone now. Thank you very much. Um, so now to get started, um, I would like to do a little quick fire uh, question session with our panel. And um, I was uh, mentioning at the beginning that we wanted to discuss conditions for success today. So I wanted to ask a very short question and I would also very appreciate a very short answer. Uh, so in two minutes or less, when is large scale land restoration successful? Who would like to volunteer to start? Maybe Walter, because you're so far away from me. <laughs> Well, it is successful when the land is restored to improve functionality. And I think the elements for success are evident in Latin America. We have a very strong political will that is riding a wind. We have uh, a comprehensive uh, number of agencies with the technical knowledge and support behind the effort that includes CIET, of course, and CATI, IUCN, and WRI. And we have the beginnings of a very ambitious architecture for financing, financial architecture for land restoration, including uh, an effort to bring uh, equity from the private sector, an effort that we are managing to put together a risk management tool and long-term financing. So if we have these elements together, I think uh, the beginnings of a successful story can be drawn. Thank you. Uh, just to answer your question, uh, 
restoration is successful when uh, physical systems are restoring, but also when economic gains are restoring for from a certain area. So if we manage to get uh, economic return, and also if we manage to uh, uh, regain functions, physical, biological functions in a system, that's when we say we are restoring. Uh, very short. Um, to me, uh, if you look at the ecosystem, at the ecosystem level, uh, you ought to have livelihoods because you are, whatever you restore, you should focus on people's lives. And those people need livelihoods. So whatever effort is done, whether by government or uh, private sector, we should ensure we are securing the livelihoods. Thank you. All right. Just passing down the line here. So the, um, the importance of landscape, uh, uh, landscape scale restoration, I, I think uh, the way we view it is it provides a framework to bring together multiple actors. When you think about what has to happen to sustainably manage a, a, a landscape, you've got uh, governments that are quite important, research that's been done, financial investors, communities, SMEs, corporate supply chain buyers, all of which need to act in some way together to make that happen across a, a broad uh, landscape. I think when you look at that, you see that change has to happen on multiple scales. So you have to have change happening at the highest level with policies and governments that promote the kind of activities that are necessary to create a sustainable landscape. But then they have to happen at the very low scales, or low, but the, the, the micro scales with small holders having the technical and financial support to actually make the changes and to improve their livelihoods and be motivated to sustain that over the long term. So you know, sort of net-net, the importance of, of landscape restoration is, is that I think it's the way in which we can create environmentally, socially, and financially sustainable landscapes and activities, particularly important tropical forest countries and countries in which there's been a high degree of land degradation. The last one has a real difficulty because a lot of good things have already been said, so I would try to come from a different perspective. I would like to define success when large-scale land restoration also contributes to stopping degradation at all. Because what we cannot afford is investing a lot of money in 20 by 20 and other very good initiatives, but business as usual is continuing and we are losing a lot of fertile soil and then end. And therefore, I don't want to see large-scale land restoration as an excuse to continue business as usual, and therefore it has to have a real political impact of course, additional to improving livelihoods and everything what my colleagues already have said. Thank you very much, Alexander. And I would like to ask if anybody has anybody um, anything to add to this question. Anybody wants to say two words about what is the importance or when is, are these initiatives successful? Not yet. Please, we'll take just, just one. I just want to have somebody from the audience. Thank you. Hi, thanks. My name is Sakila Kogetso. I'm with the CBD Secretariat. Um, so, in the context of the CBD, we have IG Target 15, which aims to restore 15% of degraded um, ecosystems by 2020. And so, I'd like to congratulate the partners and organizations that were involved in the 20 by 20 initiative. Um, in trying to support our parties to um, meet this target, to restore 15% of degraded ecosystems. We looked around at successful programs around the world, and we noticed that uh, in South Korea, um, they had the National Reforestation Program. In South Africa, they have the Working for Water. In Brazil, they have the Bolsa, Bolsa Verde, and I can't remember the others there in Portuguese, but we looked at... Pacto. Yeah. So we looked at what were the things that made these things work? Mm -hmm. um, these are large-scale programs, they're driven, there's a lot of polit um, support. So we found that for most of them, there's a lot of political support, there was a champion in government, uh, at higher level of government. They were most of the time accompanied by, uh, or accompanied the poverty reduction goals and programs of the government. And um, just like the, to take the, this chance to shamelessly plug the outcomes of the study, uh, I have brochures that I left outside. Um, 
that show some of the initial results um, of these three country studies. And just to say that by the end of next year, we hope to have a global study that looks at all programs across, across the world and, and definitely would be interested in talking and sharing the, everybody some more. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the input. And I think it's very important that you were mentioning some of these characteristics for success. And we heard also from our panel uh, bringing up some of the issues that we heard also this morning and yesterday and how these type of initiatives always have a social and environmental and an economic component. And I would like to zoom in on some of these topics and let's start maybe with the political uh, side and the governance side of, of these type of initiatives. And I wanted to ask then, uh, Tefera, what why do you think these projects were unsuccessful in some cases? Um, many of them might have been successful, but what is different now? Now that we're seeing many other initiatives being pledged by governments and by different uh, private investors, what is different now and how can we make things different? Okay. Uh, I think in the 70s, uh, in 70s, I was uh, probably a kid and I don't know. <laughs> Why they were failed, but yeah, let me share that uh, the difference of the existing success from the previous ones. Um, in the case of Ethiopia, we have very uh, two very important uh, commitments. One is uh, the commitment at uh, the ground level, uh, which is uh, community participation. And the other one is uh, the commitment at political level. So the two ends are committed, and there is no reason that uh, the one in between will not be committed. So these are very important uh, commitments which has, uh, which has uh, driven the whole process. And I guess once we have commitments from individuals at the ground level, as Deborah was uh, indicating, for restoration, a certain piece of land is uh, probably owned by a farmer or a pastoralist. And if a farmer and a pastoralist is committed to change that land, uh, then it will continue to work on it and uh, it will be more sus sustainable uh, once it has a political support from the whole system. So this, this is a unique intervention which we are seeing in Ethiopia and uh, it will make it more viable uh, and uh, sustainable. We are confident in that. People work for themselves and uh, that's very important. That's what I want to say. Thank you very much. And how have, how have you assessed the communication at the different levels of government with the stakeholders at the national level? Communication. The communication between the communities that you were saying, people were working in these projects. How has the communication been yeah. with the different levels of government? Yeah. Uh, well, there, there has been a huge awareness creation program by the government system, all the way from starting from the higher level to the ground level. And there has been a huge uh, mobilization of technical experts to create uh, awareness and capacity at different levels. And uh, this was supported by uh, uh, huge community participation in terms of contributing free level, uh, which is decided by the community themselves. Like uh, we have 30 to 60 days commitment by individual to, to commit for afforestation program, for restoration program per annum. And this is kept on schedule every year and everybody knows that uh, now this is time to do restoration practice. So there has been a long-lasting uh, commitment and communication in the system, and this has triggered a very good uh, commitment and uh, success. Thank you very much, Tefera. I wanted to um, ask one of our panelists, uh, more specifically Alexander, if you have to, something to add to this question. I think we have to face two fundamental challenges. The first challenge is that the current economic system does not take into account positive and negative externalities. Our colleagues from CPD can tell very interesting stories how poor farmers are custodians and stewards of biodiversity, which are a global public good and we all benefit from it, but they don't get paid for it. 
and you can destroy natural resources and earn a lot of money, get a lot of return on investment. So the current economic system is one of the key challenges we are facing it. In combination with my second key challenge, governance systems. We do not really have coherent governance systems if we want to tackle ecosystem services or natural resources in an integrated way. It's very much silo-oriented and therefore bringing together people, stakeholders from different areas, scientists, politicians, in order to develop an integrated governance system, maybe based on landscape level, we are at a landscape forum, is the second challenge. And I think we have to combine answers to both challenges in order to change it. Otherwise, we will continue to invest a lot of money. After five years, we will see some results. But after 10, 15 years, we will come back to this uh, sites and we will see that nothing really has changed. So we have to combine investments and all these nice activities with fundamental changes in the way we are evaluating our ecosystems, which means the economic system, and also the question of how we are governing it. And this is a very, very ambitious approach. Thank you very much. And as you were mentioning governance, maybe we'd stick on, on the topic a little bit. And I would like to ask um, Aloysius to give us a little contribution. And I wanted to ask you, Aloysius, because we were hearing this morning um, from the representative of the Colombian ministry uh, in, the, in terms of the initiative of 20 by 20 and how political will, especially a commitment um, in a long-term basis can become quite an issue when you're trying to implement one of these large-scale restoration initiatives. So how reliable do you think political commitment is to this type of initiative? And how can we go beyond uh, government structures to create more innovative accountability mechanisms for this type of implementation? Well, indeed, this is very important. Um, any successes are going to be built um, on a several elements. First of all, it's, it's uh, as uh, my colleague indicated, governance structures. You can have political will, and also just as we have had programs uh, in the past, good programs that are implemented, you get good results, but no framework. So I'll give you an example of, uh, like in Malawi, we have the Shiro River Basin. Uh, it's a basin from which um, the whole Blanta city is drawing water for drinking. And then downstream, we have big um, irrigation farms. And also within the catchment area, uh, we have wildlife parks. People do ecotourism. And then um, we also generate our electricity over 90% from there. So over time, there have been some initiatives that are being implemented on sectoral basis. But then we, we are still facing increasing problems of land degradation. So to tackle this problem, uh, government uh, has committed itself um, to establish uh, a basin-wide uh, program and uh, in the structures to ensure sustainability. Um, we are thinking of uh, uh, creating a basin authority that is going to uh, provide oversight, not only during the time of the projects, but it's, this is permanent. And then... Uh, this is at, 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 at high level, and, and at central government level, uh, also the regressions uh, to, 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 to govern um, the catchment management uh, is embedded. But not only that, we are looking at the payment for ecosystem services. Uh, some of the people mentioned. These are services which the ecosystem is providing, the water for irrigation, for drinking, the energy. Now, we, we've uh, created a forum. Uh, all these beneficiaries, the companies, private sector, NGOs, um, belong to uh, a forum. And we intend to eventually create a trust whereby uh, we are going to work out a formula. These companies should contribute some funds to put into that trust. And that trust... I will be linked uh, with the Basin Authority so that if anybody is driving uh, services, they have to put something. And for the communities that are downstream and upstream, because they are the ones managing the catchment area, currently, because of uh, uh, poor economic situation, you find they're cutting down the trees to make charcoal. So at that level, 
what we are intending to do is the monies that are contributed from these beneficiaries should be invested back uh, into those communities. And uh, so far, we have mobilized all those stakeholders for now about two years. Um, we have created a committee that meets regularly and they want to formalize this so that as far as that basin is concerned, uh, we should have permanent structures. So, if any government comes, regardless of the political ideas they have, they have to operate within those structures. And those structures should be at whatever central, but also communities must participate. So, uh, the payment for ecosystem services, we are trying to operationalize that scheme. Currently, we have appointed an NGO to kind of broker uh, between the companies and the communities, because most of the time the communities don't have a voice. So we are trying to create structures in such a way that they should have a voice um, for their developments, but also income generating activities, so that whatever is, is, is benefited or derived from the resources, it should be invested back for their benefit. Thank you very much, Aloysius. I just wanted to um, let you know that if you have any particular very brief question directed direct to the comments made by, made by the panelists, I might allow one or two uh, while we're having the panel discussion, so just don't be afraid to um, put your hand up if you have something to add. And um, now moving maybe a little bit uh, away from policy and um, political will, maybe we can talk a little bit about the environmental aspect of land restoration project. Oh, you have one? Please, yeah. Uh, can we get a microphone here, please, in the front? A gentleman from the press, if I see your badge correctly. Oh, there we go. Microphone here, please. Thank you. Please be very brief. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Julian Mulrojek. I write for Manga Bay. Um, I wanted to ask what you see as the kind of knowledge gaps in moving forward with landscape restoration and how, how can we help address those? Okay, um, thank you. Is there anybody that would like to um, start with that? Maybe Leslie, do you wanna uh, address that question? Sure. Please don't say no to me. <laughs> Sure. Could I just tie it into my fancy question you have for me? Because uh, I think they're related. I have several questions for you. So you do. You want. <laughs> um, well, I will address that question, and then you can decide how to run the penalty one. Um, I would say that, uh, first, the perspective that, that we're coming from is, is how do we bring more commercial capital to landscape restoration? And uh, the 2020 event before sort of showcased the you know, different investors that are trying to find ways to put money to work. So that's my perspective. So when I think about knowledge in doing that job, our job is to try to bring capital that benefits both the countries and the communities and the landscapes. The knowledge gap has to do with the fact that this is new. It's highly risky. And unless we can overcome, and most of these countries have many investors haven't even heard of. So for us, being able to demonstrate the commercial viability of activities within the landscape restoration process and being able to deploy capital to be able to attract more capital, that may not be exactly the knowledge gap you were looking for, but that's the gap that we see. That's the challenge that we face daily in trying to bring more funds to, 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 to landscape restoration. Thank you. Um, Alexander wanted to add something like that to that. Yeah. Maybe then Aloysio, and then we go with Valdra, OK? Uh, wait, Aloysio, uh, Alexander, thank you. I think there are different levels of knowledge gaps. Uh, from an investor's perspective, the question is how to ensure return on investment. If you turn it around from the perspective of small-scale farmers, the question is what do we have to do that they really benefit from it? In the end, it has to be linked that you are happy with the return in investment and the farmer says, also for me, it has a lot of benefits. And therefore, uh, the, the question of knowledge gaps is very, very broad. And I think we can only address them if we bring the people together to decide what kind of additional knowledge do we need, but not waiting for taking action until research has provided uh, the, the, the latest results of, of their research. So it's an ongoing process where you have to monitor right from the beginning, are the right people benefiting from restoration of landscapes? 
what should be the focus? My personal guess is if you talk about land rehabilitation, you have to go far beyond land. You have to look at livelihoods of people, of water, biodiversity. So you have to have an integrated approach. And this can only be done at a local level where all stakeholders meet and do an analysis. Is the situation really improving under all these perspectives? And maybe just in addition, uh, where I see from my experience, uh, a big gap is also the uh, trust. Most of the programs are driven by government or maybe NGOs, and the communities are left. So you find that, yes, although the people maybe are participating, they don't have much trust to involve themselves fully. So we need to reach a point where we build a lot of trust uh, by integrating the expert knowledge, but also the indigenous knowledge they have. Because most of the time we bring Okay, landscape restoration. So we think we have more ideas than them. But they do have a wealth of information uh, and, and also other practices. So what would be important would be to um, map out the best practices which they have and then fuse them with uh, um, the, the expert knowledge. So that should be the recipe uh, to move. And in that way, we can build trust and uh, by also talking to them, creating the, um, the forum for networking, discussions, and all that, opening the dialogue with them. Thank you. Do you have any particular examples of where that has worked? Sorry? Do you have any one particular example of where that has worked, the integration of the knowledges? Yes. Um, also in the, um, the, the Shira River Basin, um, in fact, two weeks ago, we had a symposium. We had to to say anybody who has anything to do from a scientific perspective and also local knowledge. Uh, so we mix all these together, people discussing. And also to explain uh, to the people to say, okay, we, we know the services which the basin provides. So what do people suggest we should do? What sh do they suggest government should do? So we created that forum. But also on a, a regular basis, um, we do have uh, committees uh, at multi sectoral, uh, at, at central level, but also in the communities. So we have appointed, for now, because the best authority is not established yet, but we have appointed an NGO which is like acting um, as a broker between the communities and, and the um, commercial entities that are exploiting the resources there. So we hope that we are going to refine these ideas and build a framework where the communities participate continuously and then engage uh, each other uh, as they develop uh, the person. Okay, thank you very much. Tepper, you wanna add something? Yeah. Well, um, I, I think technical and technological packages for restoration are locality specific. Uh, what is required uh, to, to make these uh, packages more sustainable is uh, first, uh, mechanism to make this restoration efforts more competitive um, in terms of economic return is, is very important. So giving value for resources, value addition practices, all those uh, practices are very important. The other thing is uh, we have to provide incentives. Um, incentives starts from proper valuation of the effort itself. Like in Ethiopia, we, we certify communities, we certify individuals for their efforts in achieving good practices at household level, at landscape level. And this is an incentive, just recognition. But beyond that, we have to also properly value uh, what has been done in terms of uh, capital, both natural capital, and that's very important uh, linkage, and that has to be accounted at household level, and it should be also accounted at national level. Once we establish this system, then we know that uh, these landscapes are valuable systems, not, not only for their own function, but also for people. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to touch on, on three points. The first one is on the incentives, on the economic incentives, on the economic incentives. We're doing an economic analysis uh, at WRI with Siet and Katia to look at the economic aspects of land restoration. And even though the results are not yet public, 
it's very clear that there is a very strong economic case for land restoration. And we see that in the commitments by some of the countries in Latin America. I assume some of you were at the lunch this morning. Why do you think some of those countries are saying we're going to restore millions of hectares? They are doing it out of their own benefit because they realize that in order to continue to have food production, to improve the livelihoods of rural populations, to maintain their biodiversity, water and soil, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, this needs to be done. Do you think the government of Mexico is going to wait for us to put some money uh, for them to start? No, they are putting their own money. They have a, a large projects already on the ground. What we need to do, and this is the emphasis of 20 by 20, is to bring this noble capital that makes the system makes a springboard to duplicate efforts. That's why we are bringing impact investors like Leslie, like Moringa, like Altilia. What are they going to do? They are going to invest in those resources that are noble to realize those economic benefits. It won't happen alone. We are very intent in putting together a risk management structure. A risk management structure will allow Leslie to say, okay, this is risky. Leslie, you correct me. This is risky. There is a novelty risk. There is a technology risk. There is a, a capacity risk in, in, in rural areas. I'm willing to put some money into this. And I, but I'm more willing to do it if I can cover my first loss. This is what we want to do. We, want, we are going to put together a mechanism that will absorb the first loss. My final point, um, 20 by 20 is a bottom-up approach. I don't think um, global goals will work without the willingness at the local level to do this. This is the secret of 20 by 20. It's the aggregation of national programs that were already being developed. What we have done, really, and don't tell anybody, is that <laughs> we've put all those aspirations together. So this is a national program. They are not responding to a global uh, request. They are doing this because it's in their own benefit. I have a few other <coughs> points, but maybe later. You can make them also later, but I wanted to ask you, Walter, maybe don't give up the microphone so fast, because I wanted to ask you, you were mentioning that uh, you wanted to convince Leslie to invest, for example, but Leslie was mentioning in the uh, launch of the initiative 20 by 20, but that she needs clear indicators, simple indicators to measure that land restoration is taking place, and yes. uh, she needs a monitoring system. Right. How can we provide that for her? Okay, 20 by 20, one of the components is precisely this effort. We're structuring a regional monitoring effort that has three components. Remote sensing with the most advanced satellite observation and uh, uh, flight observation systems available today with on the ground sampling and modeling. This package will vary from country to country, but we are intent with the assistance of SEAT, CATI, and IUCN. And I, don't, I keep repeating that, not because my friends are here, but because this is what is going to take place. We are going to replicate this program country by country. When we go, when we went to Mexico two weeks ago, the first thing that they said was exactly that. Mm -hmm. How do you help us to monitor what we are going to restore? And this is part of the solution. We are going to help them through WRI and our partners to set up this monitoring program. And the technology has advanced so much, the cost of monitoring have decreased so much that this is not, not, it's not pie in the sky. But in addition to that, you also need an effort to support the economic analysis. Because Leslie will be more enticed to put their money if we have a good financial case and a good economic case. The good economic case serves the government decision to support this program because it, it reverses in a lot of benefits. And the financial case will help Leslie to put their money. So we are going to support that. And finally, <laughs> we are also doing something that has been tried in the past, but is very useful, and is a south-south sharing of experiences. There are so many things taking place in Latin America. If I could have time, I would tell you about it. But there is a large, for instance, 
bewildering effort in Patagonia that is, I think, more cost effective than the one being tried in Europe. Well, this experience can be shared and we are going to finance the sharing of experience south to south with the help of these guys. Ah, and now that you're pointing to these guys, I wanted to um, give the word maybe the microphone. We have the honor of having Mario Diaz from the Convention of Biological Diversity, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to uh, explore an observation that Alexander made about uh, trying to restore uh, degraded uh, land and ecosystems while a lot of degradation is still happening. Uh, for example, if we look uh, in an analogy, the issue of threatened species, a lot of well-intended projects to reintroduce threatened species failed miserably because we didn't deal with the, th the threats. The threats were still there, so we wasted a lot of money reintroducing species and then they went extinct locally again. So do we know well enough why we do have this amount of degraded lands out there. So to what extent this is a responsibility of bad public policies or market pressures that encourage farmers to plow in marginal lands that are not uh, resilient to uh, crop uh, farming, for example, or to what extent this is related to uh, uh, heritage systems and land tenure that uh, uh, leads to uh, smaller and smaller properties which are doesn't allow for rota rotation of land use and things like that. So do we know, do we have a good uh, diagnosis of really the driving forces for uh, land and ecosystem degradation to make sure that we do tackle these as we propose large-scale uh, uh, restoration? Thank you. And before I let the panel answer that question, I have a question back to you. Uh, the Aichi target, number 15, right? Uh, is uh, trying to aim for at least uh, at least a restoration of 15% of degraded ecosystems. How do you think does that help uh, integrating these initiatives into the contribution for that target? No, totally, totally. But uh, we 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 uh, face the same challenges. For example, uh, the uh, governments under the CBD agreed with the IT target 15 to restore at least 15% of degraded ecosystems by 2020. But the countries were not precise to define the baseline or how to do it, uh, so it's a challenge. Uh, and I believe uh, we, 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 we have a chance to, to meet this if we uh, uh, bring together all these different initiatives, right? But uh, I think we need to be more strategic to really promote the large scale. So I think there's a lot of good initiatives at small scale, but the, the challenge is really how uh, to upscale and uh, what are the real uh, uh, good strategies to promote that uh, to be effective. But uh, certainly it's uh, the IG target 15, it's certainly part of this discussion. Thank you. Great. Great um, reference also to the how um, and the upscaling, but maybe we can touch upon that later on the panel. Did you have any particular responses to the intervention? Otherwise, I think I had one here. Yes? Uh, also, please, very brief here in the front. Yeah, I'd just like to take a, a bit of a skeptical viewpoint here. Um, I've been working with degraded lands since the 1980s, and there are biophysical limits to what you can do. You do cross thresholds. Getting vegetation to grow is easy. Getting good quality vegetation to grow is not so easy. Soil, organic carbon is a very slow variable. Building it back up is difficult once you've lost it. Is it really that, that, that cost effective to invest in rehabilitating degraded lands, or would it be more cost effective to, avoid, to invest in avoiding the degradation to start with? And India is losing, what, 100,000 hectares a year to water logging and salinization because they're overpumping their aquifers. The, the Kano Plains are just washing into Lake Victoria. You know, what if we started investing in, in places that were losing the land and stopped the degradation rather than putting lots and lots of money into the, these, these already degraded areas where, where it's very difficult to recover? Good, intriguing question. I think Walter has a direct response to that. This is an excellent question. Under 20 by 20, one of the goals is to avoid degradation in 5 million hectares of critical habitat that has been threatened. So as part of the entire process, we have an emphasis on avoiding degradation. So you're absolutely right. That would be the most cost effective. But there are other areas that are also cost effective. Uh, for instance, in Colombia, there are 20 million hectares of land that are dedicated to extensive cattle ranching. The Government of Colombia has a vision, long term, 
which we intend at least to capture partially, where some of that land will revert to forest cover, that area, in an area that, is, that has a vocation for forest. The process to do that is complex, but well designed, if it is well designed and well undertaken, and given the enough time, it can be achieved. And another section of those 20 million hectares by the Minister of Agriculture will be dedicated to make um, the cattle raising operations more effective, more productive in a smaller amount of land so that you can liberate land that will prevent degradation, that you won't go into pristine forests or, or wild grasslands to expand your economic activities. So I 100% agree with you. Uh, this is the practical way to go. Let's put a lot of emphasis on avoiding damage, which is the most cost effective. But there are a number of opportunities where we have to restore. And we are cognizant of the fact that land is degraded at different levels. So you go from step to step. You are not going to take a dry savanna in the province of Cordoba in Colombia, compacted and degraded, and have it restore the level that the Chinu Indians had four centuries ago. But there are steps that can be taken to improve land functionality that will be cost effective. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, and thank you for the question. And uh, setting up priorities is definitely one of the main things that we need to discuss. And that brings us back also to one of the points from Deborah's presentation on for whom are we doing this. Uh, of course, we're talking about it from an environmental perspective, but this also has a very strong social component. And on that basis, we heard this morning also from the representative of the government of Mexico that most... Uh, farmers in Mexico are actually working with land that is under five hectares of space. So with a fragmentation uh, system that is in place in that way. Alexander, how about for you? How can we ensure that large-scale land restoration actually contributes to social inclusion, but also to securing the livelihoods of uh, the poorest and the most marginalized groups in society? From my perspective, we have to ensure right from the beginning that large-scale land degradation is not leading to a situation where poor people will be kicked off their land and uh, other people are investing in land. We, we have learned the lesson since 2007, 2008, when the high food prices and the financial crisis led to a complete change in the economics of land. Land, the, the value of land has increased a lot. And therefore, we have to ensure right from the beginning that I don't want to call it social inclusiveness. This has to be driven by the communities. Otherwise, we are coming to a situation where maybe we are doing the wrong land restoration. From an agricultural point of view, land with low productivity has to be rehabilitated. From a biodiversity point of view, this land could have high values from biodiversity. And this will be very complex to be assessed by indicators. And therefore, we have to have the communities on board right from the beginning to decide how to restore, who should benefit from it. And when uh, I raised the question of risk management, we have really to align interests there. We have to come to a situation where restoration of land is good for Leslie because she earns the return on investment, but also at the same time good for the people on the ground. If we don't do it in this way, we will come to a situation where the conflicts might increase. And uh, l let's not be naive, land restoration is also an area where there will be a lot of conflicts. There are competing interests. The question of water availability, who has access to land, and, and, and. This can only be done if you have really solid institutional settings and you have involvement of the stakeholders right from the beginning. Otherwise, we will have a discussion in five years and we will uh, analyze why things are not, it did not work really very well. So this is for me a condition right from the beginning, involvement of the stakeholders to ensure the right way of restoration and to ensure that there are benefits for all, that Leslie gets her money back and some interest rates, but people on the ground improve their, their livelihoods. Um, thank you. Um, Les, do you have something particular directly to that? Well, yeah, I have a couple of things to say. That would be great, because that, <laughs> that's actually an important question. Can we make a business case for the for poor uh, land, well, poor, pro-poor land restoration? Is that a thing? Yeah, and, and we have seen that absolutely uh, you can. 
not all landscape restoration activities are going to be commercially viable, though. And that, and knowing which ones are, identifying those, and being able to support others with other sources, non-commercial sources of funding, is quite key. It's really interesting to hear Alexander talk about um, the involvement of communities, because for any investor, that is absolutely the first thing. The what what I would call the alignment of interest, what people that write about this call equity, but equity is not the kind of equity we think about. It's very interesting. The word equity does not equal equity. The word investment does not equal investment. So when we think about the, the ways in which um, commercial, um, commercial funds can flow to those um, types of landscape restoration activities that they're suitable for, it, uh, it starts with the fact that um, we need to invest in places where we can combine income streams. Uh, so we're combining income streams that include generally smallholder agriculture, uh, non-timber forest products, um, uh, sometimes sustainable forestry, and, and emission reductions. And finding ways to do that and ensuring the food security is still there uh, and improved, um, and, and being able to structure the transaction in a way that interests are aligned. Because if they're not, the investment is very high, high risk. Some of the other things that we look for in, in being able to bring capital to landscape restoration is the involvement of governments. Without the involvement of governments, sometimes it's a uh, very direct involvement where investments go through quasi-government entities that have been set up. Um, I've had the pleasure to work in Malawi, and we actually have a, a invest an entity that's set up and, and investable that is partially owned by the government and partially owned by the community association for some work around three of the protected areas there. So the importance of integrating the governments into it, again, they may be direct participants of the investment, they, may, they need to definitely be supporting the investment, and often Oftentimes, they can facilitate that investment. Um, a couple other things that we're seeing as I, as everyone wants to talk about landscape restoration and red and climate smart agriculture, the, the reality is all those things are part of creating sustainable landscapes. So without mincing the words, for us, we also think it's important to be able to leverage uh, this interim finance that we're seeing with results-based payments that are being paid for emission reductions, uh, particularly in countries that have um, have engaged with the carbon fund, have engaged with red early movers, are engaging with the, the new um, ISFL, because those transactions can help bring new funds in, because it can actually lower the risk for people that are investing, investors that are investing. So that's another thing. And then two other sort of catalyzing things that allow us to invest in, in landscape restoration. One is um, really, we've already talked about this, very strong partnerships with local organizations and community groups and the ability to aggregate smallholders in a way that we can put money together on the kind of scale we need to. But also leveraging the local and adapting the local financing instruments, small scale microfinance, uh, development, uh, small scale development bank finance, local financial institutions that can bring additional capital to smallholders. Uh, and, and also providing the technical assistance to help those smallholders make an informed decision about whether or not they actually want to take on that kind of debt, uh, which is quite important. And, and then not necessarily uh, specific to a particular country's investment, but also finding ways to deploy some of the great, great risk mitigation instruments that are out there so that our fund in investing in Malawi or Ethiopia or any of the countries we're looking at, Guatemala, that we can lower risk for investors and make a compelling case. And that includes things like the USAID a debt guarantee. It's called the DCA program that they've just come out with recently that, uh, that provides a huge amount of risk reduction to investors using OPEC's political risk insurance, which we deployed for the first time for a red project that we invested in which lowers the, the country risk associated with investment. So when we look at it, it, those are sort of the things that we see. Obviously, each one of the things we invest in has to generate a return. That's another thing. So it has to generate a return between 10 and 25%, depending on what the risk is of that. So hopefully that answers some of your question. IRR. Wow. Uh, I think uh, Walter has a very direct response to that, and then we're going to bring it back to the audience. We have well, a question here in the front, maybe the microphone slowly. Yes. Why is it that we are not yet working with Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, but with Terra Bella and Moringa and Altilia? It's precisely because of your question, because we are placing a premium on those impact investment funds that associate themselves with the local communities. Maybe in the future, all these 
other companies will see the light and will do the same. But 20 by 20 is associating itself with impact investors. Precisely, it's the answer that Leslie gave to you, and that, that makes the difference for us. When, 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 we see, when we say private capital, we are seeing private capital that mixes with the local equity, the social local equity in, in the rural areas. Uh, you have a question, Zirka? <laughs> Walter, I would be very interested. What is the role of land rights in, in your 20 t times 20 program? Because in a former life, I was involved a lot in, in setting up UN Red. And one of the key issues was land rights in areas where you have traditional land rights, uh, the commons. Uh, how are you going to deal with it? Because this is also a risk, uh, risk minimizing instrument for investments, but that's also very, very important for, for, for the farmers that they are willing to take the risk and that they, are really, that they can really invest. And, and we know that we have many areas in the world where land rights are very un insecure, uh, very low uh, access to land for women and, and, and so how, how are you going to deal with it? Sorry, yeah. moderator. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, remember that 20 by 20 is an effort to change the dynamics of land degradation. Don't focus on the 20 million hectares. Well, you can focus on it as the first step, but this is a long-term vision. So it would be silly of us to get into an area where there is a lot of conflict, where land is in dispute to start this process. No? You have to create trust and confidence and I think that what will happen on the ground is that Moringa and Altilia and Terra Bella and others will be attracted to areas where these basic enabling conditions are being worked out. And we're willing to help. When we say will, I look at you guys, Siat and Katya and IOCN. All of us as a group are willing to help to put those enabling conditions together. But it would be silly to start in an area where there are no I have to make a comment. I'm <laughs> sorry. I love this question all the time because um, it is, I think there's a perception that land tenure is a barrier to investment. And of course, but, but there are some places where it is. But investment can actually support land tenure, not only the securing of land tenure. I can, we have operated in five or six different tenure schemes, most of which are either co-management. In Malawi, co-management is the legal framework in which uh, we operate. In uh, Cambodia, it's community forestry. In Zanzibar, it's community forestry. And the beauty of that is, one, some of the investment dollars go to actually helping secure that. So if the process isn't complete, it usually has to be pretty close to complete. And clearly, we don't get involved in areas where it's which you can't do that. But then once you have international investment and some of the technology that's used to monitor that, the kinds of things we use to monitor, we use a spatially explicit, explicit nested monitoring. Once you have that, the level of transparency goes up. And when you then register an emission reduction program on there, it becomes a little bit hard to change your mind about tenure because all the documents that have supported that. What I mean is, is that if a government were to try to reverse the land tenure that's been granted or not to honor that, we have all the satellite images, we have all the documents, we have everything, and with a push of a button, you can see him sitting in San Francisco, California, or wherever you want to be sitting. So anyway, I love the question. I know you would keep that up for me. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. We have um, probably a contribution maybe directly to that from the audience, and then we're going to take up a couple more questions. Hi, uh, thanks, Chair. My name is Yes. I'm with the ISS, and equally, I feel equally engaged, Leslie, with the point that you just made as you felt when you made your point, because sort of talking about large-scale land investments, what we have seen is that the majority of these investments go exactly in those areas where governments are extremely poor. Um, so, what the the, the case that you've painted is the rather positive case. The large-scale analysis of irresponsible land investments is unfortunately exactly the opposite. Uh, on my question that I had, I would like to start off with a question that our colleagues from SEAD have put forward, which is whose livelihoods are at stake? And I have in this respect a question and a concern. My question actually is on the financial architecture uh, of 20 by 20 and the business case behind. I'm, I'm perfect. I've, I trust WRI in coming up with a famous sort of 
cost-benefit analysis of that. However, having worked in the Brazilian Amazon with small herders and sort of the, the effort that this implies in actually restoring landscapes, I do have serious doubts regarding the transaction costs that are implied when you actually make these large-scale rehabilitation efforts work for small herders. And you yourself, Walter, mentioned the monitoring costs involved. So my concern with this large-scale rehabilitation is, isn't then because of the investment uh, rates on return that Leslie has mentioned and the monitoring costs, for example, to give one example, transaction costs that you have referred to, isn't then large-scale land restoration something that has the high risk of ending up in large-scale projects that it leaves exactly leave the smallholders behind because of the challenges that sort of investing in smallholders has? Thank you. Thank you. We have a direct, let's take the, the second question here uh, in the fourth row and then we can pass it on to Walter to answer. Uh, Berta Vievre from uh, Conde Sandwater and Catchment Area. And, um, actually a little bit related, I think. Um, uh, I would like, well, degradation can have different degrees, no? There is moderately degraded land and severely degraded land and completely lost land or bad lands, or however you want to call it. So what, what kind of mechanisms or incentives can we build into this kind of program so that we don't forget no, don't leave aside the worst of the worst. I think where we can probably have a, a marginal uh, benefit, which is very important for the society. You know, if we go, uh, if we go for restoration of agriculture, probably when we go into the field at the end, we will go for the little bit less degraded. So where we have a, a chance of building up some success uh, in terms of production of agriculture or forestry or whatever. But how, do, how do we really include the worst lands? Thank you. Um, Walter and Ben Tefera, okay? Do you have okay, your microphone? Yes, again, a uh, very interesting question. You cannot generalize, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you are right in that uh, smallholders, high transaction costs, difficult approach, huge risk, and so forth. I've spoken already about this new instrument that we are trying to structure that will absorb those costs. So if Altilia climate goes to an area of in the Amazon, in Brazil you mentioned, where the transaction costs make it impossible to get a successful outcome, then this instrument will absorb some of those costs. But let me give you two positive examples. In Mexico, the national program of dry lands, CONASA, no? Con, con, well, the national program of dry areas, is focused on small holdings. And what they are doing is economies of scale. It's amazing, but what they want to do in terms of recovering of those dry lands is bringing equipment that will help technologies, that will help them recover some of the vegetation cover, and they move the equipment from landholder to landholder. So no one pays the equipment totally, and everybody contributes. I think it's a magnificent example. I've seen photographs of what they are intending to do, and the results are very interesting. With the right technology, moving from plot to plot, you can really see a regreening uh, quickly. Uh, the other example that I have for you is Bosque's Modelo. Uh, Ronnie is here, no, Ronnie, Ronnie, no. Ronnie del Camino has this program, he's the president of Bosque's Modelo, which is a program for small farming for small rural areas. And what he has optimized is the deal, the business deal with small landholders. And they are, uh, they are confident enough to propose a goal of 1.6 million hectares of restored land. And this is by no means small, uh, large areas, no? These are relatively small. So these are two examples. But I agree with you on the generic comment. It's difficult. Smaller areas, more difficult, cost higher. For the investment, for the you'll have to ask Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody go get Ronnie, please. <laughs> please. Okay, um, I would like to uh, say that how, first of all, how do we value restoration? In order to, to say this is uh, feasible or worth investing, uh, I think we have to first uh, look into the value of restoration. 
two points. One, when we restore degraded lands and where, when we start uh, supporting livelihood in degraded lands, it is not only the product and service from the degraded lands themselves, but also we protect non-degraded lands not to be degraded. Because if those degraded lands are not restored and they don't support any livelihood, the alternative is people will move to additional areas and further degradation will continue. So we have to account that. The other thing is some countries, some areas, they cannot afford leaving those lands degraded forever. It's impossible. And we have to do something and we have to grab opportunities as they provide. Be it uh, minimum or maximum, we have to do something. We know ecological processes are gradual, but we have to, we, we have seen that it is possible to make livelihood also, not just by exploiting the soil resources or the, the biological resources there, but also doing alternative activities in the system. So we have to capitalize on that. The, the last point which I want to make on the monitoring is when we are monitoring um, restoration efforts in the landscape, we, have, uh, we, we need to have three layers. The first one is the achievement in terms of physical gains, vegetation cover changes, soil property changes, and others. And we have to also account functional gains in the system, which includes also biodiversity gains. So we have to establish a baseline, and also we have to monitor and look into the changes in function in hydrology. In Ethiopia, we have seen changes in um, uh, spring development after restoration of degraded lands, and this is very important. But the last point which you have to account is also change in the livelihood system. So we need to do MRV for livelihood, MRV for functions of ecosystem, MRV for physical systems. Thank you very much. Um, so now we have 15 minutes left for the discussions. Um, but first, let me ask you to stand up, please, for a second. Everybody, stand up, stand up, stand up. We have to wake up. <laughs> One big stretch. I promise. 15 more minutes. This is it. One big stretch. 15 minute stretch. Uh, let's. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Let's sit down. So um, for this last bit of the discussion, I would like to come back to our initial question. And if you remember our panel at the beginning, lay out some of the main criteria that we want to have for successful large-scale restoration projects. And you were mentioning that we need to ensure that land is restored, that the ecosystem is made good again, basically, that we need to ensure livelihoods, that the governance system is in place and everybody gets their return back. So we know what we need to ensure. And I want you to think now uh, about the how. Let's focus on the strategies. How can we make that happen on the field? And while I'll give you a second to think about that, my colleagues from SEAD have asked me uh, to take you know, one of these very complex questions and I want to give you the opportunity to have a very black and white response. So it's going to be a yes or no response and everybody has a little um, card, colored cards on their chairs. Uh, I'm sure you've seen them. And um, I would like to ask you that while we're discussing the, the how for the last bit of the discussion, that you write down your answer to the question, is large-scale uh, land restoration the way to go? Is this the right solution for sustainable landscape management? Yes or no? Please write yes or no on your card, and why? So very short answers, and then our colleagues from SEAT, um, Abby and Martina, will be very nice to pick up and collect the cards and uh, post them there. So while you do that, let's get back to the panel and um, let's start with the how. Maybe Aloysius, we haven't heard from you for a little bit. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the how, de definitely it's um, uh, a very critical question uh, because this is where um, we can fail or succeed. Uh, but as we have been discussing here, uh, we need to know first what is it we are dealing with and to be focused, who, who is involved and then we should identify champions because if you are doing these things in a vacuum, 
uh, nobody becomes responsible. But I think in any system or the landscape where we are, we are working, we should identify uh, the champions. Uh, these are champions from the public sector, uh, government sector, as well as other institutions and the communities who are actually the drivers uh, of these processes. And, and then we should also look at the policy aspects. Whatever we do uh, must be enshrined in, in the policies because any good actions that we do, if there's no policy framework, then they cannot stay very long. So to provide guidance to governments that are existing and also those to come, all these uh, must be enshrined in, in, in good policy so that um, uh, the results we get uh, can be sustainable. But also we should look at uh, building resilience because most of the times uh, we have uh, done efforts very successful for one year, two years, then it collapses. So we should ensure that uh, in short term, we have to do things like in short term, and those in long term, we should also have those long term perspectives. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think I can answer this question relatively easily because capital markets will do their job if they can make a return. It's pretty cold and hard and harsh. But the reality is, is that there's enough money out there that if landscape restoration can provide attractive risk-adjusted returns, money will flow. So that part will, will happen. But for that to happen, um, what is critical is to have both national and local um, you know, investable environments, the conditions to make an investment. And th those can be very high-level national conditions, meaning that regulations are in place to bring in international investment. But it also could include very local, local that allow for community tenure to be secure, tracking, and governance. The other thing is, is that I think being able to get good information on the um, operational risk uh, and the financial costs and returns. So all of the great research and piloting that is done and making that available, easily available, so that when we look for capital markets to come in and bring, bring money, they can, they can make a wise or an informed decision, not necessarily wise, but you know, informed decision. And then the other thing is a willingness to engage. I think, you know, I, I come from the private sector. I come from the evil world of Wall Street. I mean, I've been at it long enough that I can almost stop saying that. But, and I still feel, I don't today, which is wonderful, but I still feel sometimes you, like, oh, you're private sector. Well, you've got, you've got to have something that's not good in mind. So really the willingness to engage, because we want to build trust. We absolutely want to build trust. I mean, you look at half of the money that's out there, no private sector firms. Like, seriously? They're being deployed for development purposes. So we really hope to build the trust and to be able to engage and have an open dialogue about how to make it work for all the stakeholders involved. So those are the things we'd like to help be part of making, making it happen. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more on the how, Leslie, on the building trust, but then maybe we can come back to you for that one. Tefera and, and then Walter, and, and after that we're gonna have some interactions with the audience. Okay, um, on the how, I, I want to say three things. One is commitment at different level, and the other one is incentive. And as I said, this incentive is uh, starts from recognition. And um, the last one is uh, value addition of products uh, which are produced from restoration efforts. And if we make this uh, all possible, it's possible to have uh, good restoration efforts in the landscape. Okay, how? We have three elements, and I told you a little bit about them at the beginning. And the first one, is that people want to do it. The economists want to do it. So this has to be a bottom-up approach. We are working with Mexico and Peru and Colombia and Guatemala and Chile and Ecuador because they want to do it. We are not going to convince them from outside that this is the way to go. They have their own programs, they are putting their own money, they are putting their own resources. So that's the first one. You have to work with those that want to do it. Number two is to bring the capital and the financing structure and I already told you we had this vision of the three elements 
equity, or we want to emphasize private sector, because the Coleman budgets are already committed, two, a risk management structure, and three, long-term development with the local development banks. That's the second part, bring the financing. And the third one is to help these governments to, as uh, some of you in the panel said before, overcome the barriers. There are a number of barriers that need to be tackled, and this is why this partnership of agencies are working on the monitoring part, on the training and technical part, on the economic analysis part. We will only be successful if we can bring together better livelihoods for people, especially the poor, with improving ecosystem services. And there, I fully agree, we need capital and we need private sector. But we also need good regulation for it, especially after the world financial crisis. We can see that capital markets and return of investments per se is not a guarantee for improving livelihoods. Uh, Billions of people are still paying for the risks uh, of, of the financial markets. And therefore, we have to also talk about what are the conditions under which we can really use private capital and under which we have responsible investments. And here, I think we are very close. Uh, I have looked before the, the session on your website, and I, I can see a lot of these things to it. So bringing together the different interests, but clearly based on objectives. I think this, this is the real question. And one size doesn't fit all. We know that in different areas of the world we have different uh, things to do. And the big advantage of this large-scale investment uh, debate is that we are raising awareness. Soils have not received the attention they deserve. Soils were forgotten at the international agenda, very often at the national agenda. And this is a big advantage. And making also clear that restoring land costs a lot of money could be a contribution to stop the drivers of deforestation. But it needs political will and it needs the right investment there. Thank you, Alexander. Um, we're going to take um, some inputs from the audience. And I see my colleagues are also um, already picking up the, the cards. So if you can pass them on to them with the answers to the question. I will take the first question, please, here in the front. So we need a microphone. Um, and then we'll take the one here in the back. A microphone, please. Microphone. Microphone, por favor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have no doubt that the private investment is needed to tackle some of these serious Did environmental you problems. I'm so sorry. Uh, Miguel Pinedo, um, C4, and Columbia University, and also from the Amazon. Um, I'm saying that no doubt about the private investment might play a big role in dealing with the environmental issues they're facing. And I would like to hear from the private sector, however is how we can start thinking about investment, moving from just focusing profit, going more into welfare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and then th the second question here in the back. There we go. Yes, please, there. Hi, I'm Julia. I'm from South Pole Group. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the bond challenge is going to be uh, like one, 150 million of hectares by 2050. And we, we know about the initiative about 2020. So I would like to know the future step to achieve this challenge about the bond challenge. And we are, we are talking about the implementation of the project, but what about the the monitoring and which institution or organization will ensure that this restoration is going to be well done. So it's going to be sectorial or governmental. So I would like, uh, which is the role of the private sector in this implementation? Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take one more all the way in the back, please. Or maybe, maybe two more in case there's... Hi, I'm Ken Andrasco from Winrock International, formerly World Bank. Um, my question is, this is an incredibly interesting panel, lots of uh, nuances in detail, but to achieve the kind of scale we're looking for from the private sector, I think we need to deconstruct private sector investment and role into its many, many parts. People tend to think of very large 
investments from large firms, but in fact, there could be roles providing financial services or producing uh, inputs to agriculture like fertilizers at concessional prices, all kinds of things. So how can we move forward to somehow find the way to deconstruct the private sector role into its many parts and get the right people talking? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to take maybe one, two comments from the panel. Um, and then I'll ask my colleagues from SIAT if they are more or less ready with the wrap up with the cards. Abby and Martina? Yes, I'm talking to you. Hi. <laughs> and uh, after two interventions from the panel, then I would ask you to give us a, a little comment on the results of our little survey. Please. Thank you for the questions. Um, all of them uh, with some, uh, some link to private sector. The first one, how can we move private sector from profit to welfare? So I would never, I mean, working in this sector is hard enough, so I would never be able to believe that I could change capital markets from a profit-based motive. But that said, pr private sector firms that understand the sector and are committed to the sector for the long term We'll look at welfare for the very selfish reason is if welfare isn't maintained, improved, considered, an absolutely integral part of any investment, the risk is way too high. So the way we see that is that yes, we have certain financial hurdles that we have to make, but if the, pro pro the investment isn't well aligned with communities and their welfare is not at the center of the design, and the center of the way in which uh, returns are generated back to them, it's way too high a, a risk investment. So it's not a direct, it's an indirect, um, but like I said, anyone that operates in the sector, uh, invests in the sector, has to, that knows anything will do that. I think the second question in the back, um, I don't know that it's necessarily a private sector question. I, I think, Julia, if I, if I understood you, you were talking about ha making sure that this is done properly. You know? And um, I think it's all of our jobs to make sure it's done properly. It's our job to make sure that our investment structures reward those who actually produce the returns. We also have to make sure we make a return for the capital that's come from our investors. But I would say, and I'd like you know, to have you guys offer that, you know, the governments have a role, uh, NGOs have a role, all, all of us have a role. So I'm gonna punt that question down the right road there. And Ken, thank you. Ken always has the most thought-provoking questions, and you are absolutely right. And in fact, the, f the very, the beautiful thing is private sector is actually here today. We actually get to come and sit here. This is great. This has only been in the last couple of years that, that otherwise we were in a little room over there, right? And you, you are right that there are multiple private sectors. I'm speaking from the standpoint of a private equity investor. But you have SMEs that are in country, very important. You have small holders that are making investments every day. You have corporate supply chain buyers that are making investments of sorts. You have people that are willing to buy emission reductions, um, unbelievably so. So I think, Ken, you're right, and if we, I think more, when we have more and more panels on engaging private sector, that segmentation that you brought up and being able to, uh, able to understand how each subsector of the private sector can engage and actually facilitate landscape restoration is, is key, because you point out a very good thing. So I'll turn it over to others with that. Thank you. Oh, wait, this has got to go. Oh, no, this goes. You can, you can pass it on, and... Um, Aloysius, you, do you have a comment? Yeah, just a small one. Um, as she indicated, th this should be a partnership. We have government on one side. So if there are social costs, social risks, well, the company cannot take those. This is where maybe once we do the risk assessment, those things which a, a private company cannot take, I think that's the social responsibility of government to take those. And then the the company will focus on, on where the return can come. But to the extent that we are building resilience in terms of climate change, we, we can't be doing this without knowing that we are reducing um, we are reducing the risk. So if it's for three years, yes, we will invest with the risk, but with confidence that by the end of the three years, you have reduced the risk. Other than just operating in a, in a, in a situation where you don't know you are reducing the risk or maybe you are making improvements. Thank you. Thank 
you, Aloysius. Um, okay, I have, did you, have, oh, sorry. Exactly, um, very, very short. Um, it, it's actually the um, coffee break that is starting, and I just wanted to, yeah, I know you you do not want to get in, in the middle of people in coffee, Alexander, so um, I am sure that we're going to have to wait for that one for the next time. And I just wanted to give a minute to our colleagues from the Water Landscape, um, Land Water Ecosystems Program to say a um, few words. And what were the results of our survey? So we've posted them there. You can see there's an overwhelming amount of yes. Uh, but we have a lot of yes with conditional statements. So yes, if scalable, yes, if we look enough at livelihoods, yes, if we focus on ecosystem services. So we put them there so you can go and kind of see. Uh, we had a few no's. Uh, it causes overgeneralization. Uh, there were some other concerns that you can see posted there. We wanted to read one out that we thought was particularly interesting. Um, I believe so, but I disagree with the focus on financial returns from restoration efforts. As with Red Plus, the market will look for the most profitable investments, which in almost all cases will exclude the most marginalized communities and likely providing perverse incentives for land grabbing. So anyways, we thought we'd read one. Uh, please go over there and see, see what some of the other responses were. Thank you, thank you very much. And I think that if anything, we are left with a lot of questions to answer and a lot of um, research tasks uh, for these particular topics. So I know that um, our colleagues will have a lot to do in the next um, years to try to answer some of these questions. And I just wanted to really quickly thank the Water, Land and Ecosystems Program and SEAT for putting together this event. And I want to thank you very much, our panelists and our audience, for your wonderful contributions and inputs. And uh, like Abby said, go ahead and, and have a look at the survey. So thank you very much. And please enjoy coffee break.